This is North Korean leader Kim Jong-un says a good program will be arranged sooner or later for his second summit with U.S. President Donald Trump. Officials from South Korea's ruling party, the government and the presidential office gathered to discuss the big issues of the day. We have the latest from our correspondent at the top office. Plus, Turkey concludes a prominent Saudi journalist who wrote for the Washington Post and has written critically about the Saudi government was murdered in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. So let's start with the latest efforts to break the gridlock in the denuclearization process. And in a potentially positive development, the U.S. State Department says North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has invited inspectors to visit the regime's Pungeri nuclear test site so they can confirm it has been completely and irreversibly dismantled. The statement comes after State Department spokesperson Heather Nowert said U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo held productive discussions with Kim on Sunday and we'll have more on that shortly. Back in May, North Korea blew up three test tunnels at the Pungeri site, also destroying security checkpoints and other facilities. A North Korean leader, Kim Jong-un, has expressed his belief that a, quote, good program will be arranged sooner or later for his second summit with U.S. President Donald Trump. According to the North state-run media on Monday, Kim voiced his optimism as he bid farewell to U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, who made a one-day trip to Pyongyang on Sunday. It added Pompeo and Kim discussed ways to keep the denuclearization talks going and a second summit between Kim and Trump following their first historic talks in June. And America's top diplomat, Mike Pompeo, has briefed South Korean President Moon Jae-in following his meeting with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un on Sunday. The exact details of what was discussed has not been disclosed, but it appears Kim and President Trump will be meeting for a second time before too long. Che Xiong reports. Another step forward. That's how U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo described his one-day stay in Pyongyang to President Moon Jae-in. Welcoming Pompeo to Seoul on Sunday, President Moon said it was an important moment for the three relevant parties, the two Koreas and the U.S. Pompeo, uh, 장관님의 방북과 uh, 앞으로 곧 있을 제2차 미국 정상회담이 한반도의 비핵화와 평화 프로세스에서 되돌아갈 수 없는 Pompeo said it was extremely important he held talks with the leaders of the Koreas in a row, as Seoul plays a leading role in the region's denuclearization. Uh, but we had a good, productive conversation. As President Trump has said, there are many steps along the way, uh, and we took one of them today. It was another step forward, and so uh, this is, I think, a good outcome for all of us. South Korea's presidential office said Pompeo agreed with the North to hold a second summit as early as possible, and that working-level talks on shaping the summit are expected soon. It also said Pompeo discussed further steps of the regime's denuclearization as well as the issue of the U.S. government being present throughout those steps. Though the main aspects of the meeting between Kim Jong-un and Pompeo, like the shape and form of the next summit or the corresponding measures from Washington, have not been disclosed, Pompeo's visit to Pyongyang was reportedly better than the last. Citing a U.S. official who had accompanied Pompeo to Pyongyang, Reuters reports progress was made, but added it's going to be a long haul. Speculation now lingers on when the next Kim Trump summit will happen, with most watchers expecting it to happen before the U.S. midterm elections on November 6. Choi Xiong, Arirang News. So, as you can see there, it was all smiles as U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo met with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un over the weekend. But where exactly does this leave the chances for a second North Korea-U.S. summit? And also, where does it leave the denuclearization process? Our EG1 with more. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo's fourth visit to Pyongyang seems to have gone well. According to the New York Times, Pompeo had a two-hour-long meeting with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, followed by a 90-minute luncheon hosted by the North's leader at the state guesthouse of Baekwawon. Footage shows the two warmly greeting each other and exchanging pleasantries on their way to the lunch table. Even there, the two hinted on what appeared to have been a successful meeting. 
We talked about a lot of things earlier, and though I'm careful, I think it's a very nice day that promises a good future for both of us. And a great, a great visit this morning. Uh, thank you for hosting. President Trump sends his, his regards, and we had a very successful morning. So thank you, and I'm looking forward to our time together here at lunch as well. Shortly after arriving in South Korea following the visit, Pompeo posted a photo on Twitter of himself walking with Kim, saying he had a good trip to Pyongyang. President Trump also tweeted on the good meeting the two had, expressing his hope to see Kim again in the near future. Despite the positive atmosphere, not much has been openly shared on the denuclearization front. But amid renewed hopes, many speculate the two sides might agree on more concrete actions. That could include the U.S. declaring an end to the Korean War and the North taking additional measures such as dismantling its key nuclear facility. Recently, some also suggest the two sides may have taken new cards out in their negotiations. The North has been bringing up sanctions relief, while Pompeo mentioned the regime's chemical and biological weapons program during his talks with Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe a few days ago. With the two agreeing to form a working-level group, there's speculation the newly appointed U.S. Special Representative for North Korea, Stephen Began, may soon meet with Che Tan Yi, North Korea's vice foreign minister in charge of U.S. relations. It was Began's first time in the North, but Che was in Russia for talks with officials in Moscow. Yi ji Arirang News. Now let's turn to some local politics because the representatives of the ruling party, the government and the top office, they uh, met this morning to discuss a variety of pending uh, issues that are very important to the country. So let's connect to our Shin Semin, who's monitoring the latest for us. So Semin, I hear they uh, had a lot to chew over uh, this morning. Just walk us through the main agenda items, if you wouldn't mind. Mark, of course, the main talking point was the latest on North Korea, given that America's top diplomat Mike Pompeo just briefed President Moon Jae-in last night after flying in from Pyongyang, but the officials also discussed the current status of the South Korean economy. Now, the second round of talks with the leadership of ruling Democratic Party, the prime minister and officials from the presidential office was held at the prime minister's official residence just a couple blocks away from the top office early this morning, and there the president's now National Security Chief Chung Yong said Pompeo's latest visit to the North was confirmed to be a fruitful and productive one. He also added the denuclearization process will have gained some momentum, especially with the second Kim-Trump summit likely to take place in the near future. And the top security chief also said he will do his part in making Kim's recent promise a reality that the North Korean leader visits Seoul by the year's end. OK, so lots of positive news on North Korea, but uh, what did the officials have to say in regards to South Korea's current economic difficulties? Right. Talks on the country's economy was also another major talking point this morning. The participants went over South Korea's economic status to review the necessity of further steps, one of them being the overheated property market and efforts to tackle the high unemployment rate. The Asian Development Bank recently issued a warning over Korea's overheated real estate market ignited by loose credit policies in recent years, even leading to lowering the country's growth projections for this year and the next. And also the jobless rate here in Korea had been hitting the highest figure since the global financial crisis. So the Prime Minister Lee Nagyon said this morning that he's carefully monitoring the economic circumstances, adding that the government will handle issues for the mid and long term while trying to minimize the fallout of such policies. And the ruling representative, ruling party representatives, that is, added that they would try to work with the opposition bloc to get bipartisan support behind efforts to rejuvenate the country's structural economic issues. And that's all for me at this hour of reporting on the latest high-level three-way meeting, but I'll be back with more in our latest newscast. Now, officials in Turkey say they believe a missing Saudi journalist has been killed at the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. Turkey's president says he's closely following 
the investigation. For more on this and other news from around the world, let's turn uh, to our no Adam. So Adam, just walk us through what's going on. Well, Mark, Jamal Khashoggi was last seen visiting the Saudi consulate last Tuesday. He has contributed articles to the Washington Post opinion section and has been an outspoken critic of the Saudi leadership. A former colleague had suggested he left the kingdom out of fear of retribution for his criticism of Saudi policy in the Yemen war and its crackdown on dissent. He entered the consulate to get documents for his upcoming marriage with his Turkish fiancée, who was waiting outside. She says she never saw him re-emerge from the building, contradicting comments made by Saudi officials who said he left shortly after entering. But she tweeted that she cannot believe her fiancé has been killed, adding she was waiting for confirmation from Turkish authorities. Saudi Arabia, meanwhile, has denied accusations the journalist was murdered, saying it's searching for him. Turkish officials, however, say they have concrete evidence he was killed, but none has been presented yet. President Recep Tayyip Erdogan told reporters he's closely following the investigation. And being the president of the Turkish Republic, I am following it personally, and we will let all the world know the outcome of this. Everything, including entries and exits to the consulate, are being investigated. Also, departures and arrivals to airports are being investigated as well. China has confirmed it's holding the former head of Interpol, Men Hong Wei, for unspecified breaches of the law. Meng, who is also Beijing's vice minister for security, was reported missing by his wife on Friday after she said she had not heard from him since he went to China at the end of last month. Interpol on Sunday said it had received his resignation from the presidency with immediate effect but did not say why. Senior Vice President Kim Jong-yang uh, Jong of South Korea has been appointed as acting president. Twenty people have been killed in a traffic accident in upstate New York involving a limousine carrying a wedding party. The limousine crashed into a parked vehicle and two pedestrians after it sped through an intersection over the weekend. All 18 people in the limo and the two pedestrians were killed. The cause of the crash is still unclear, but a National Transportation Safety Board team is investigating the scene. The NTSB said Saturday's incident was the deadliest transportation accident in the United States since a 2009 plane crash in Buffalo that killed 49 people. At least 14 people have now died after Saturday's 5.9 magnitude earthquake in Haiti, with more than 100 others injured. A local official said at least eight people died in Port de Pay on the northern coast near the epicenter. Four people were said to have been killed in and around the town of Gromorne, further south, including a woman who died from a heart attack. Another person was killed in the town of Chanson when a house collapsed and one other person in Saint-Louis-de-Nord. Many, build many buildings have been destroyed by the devastating quake and rescue efforts are still ongoing. Thank you to our Noah Adam there for the world news. Now, a little uh, closer to home here in South Korea, an oil storage tank exploded in Goyang, northwest of Seoul on Sunday. It sparked a massive fire that was only brought under control after 17 hours. The tank, which is owned by the state-run Daehan Oil Pipeline Corporation, burst into flames at 11 a.m. on Sunday and was still going far into the night, sending fumes and toxic gas to nearby areas. The tank contained about four and a half million tons of gasoline and was surrounded by a 60 centimeter thick wall, which fortunately stopped the fire from spreading to other areas. Firefighters say the fire was finally put out just before 4 a.m. this morning. Authorities in Japan are set to release water from the Fukushima nuclear power plant into the sea. This despite reports the water is still highly radioactive after many attempts to decontaminate it. Lee Sung Jae with the details. Despite reports, treated water at the Fukushima nuclear plant needed to be decontaminated even more before it can be released into the sea. The Japan government has decided to release it anyway. 
The Japan-based newspaper Mainichi Shimbun reports that Japan's nuclear regulation authority chief told reporters recently that the authority plans to release the water once the radiation levels are lower. However, he added the authority doesn't think more distillation or dilution will help, nor does he think it's necessary. Almost 85 percent of the water is said to contain dangerously high levels of radioactive materials. According to the plant's operator, Tokyo Electric Power Corporation, about 161,000 tons of the treated water is 10 to 100 times over the limit for release into the environment, and another 65,000 tons is up to 20,000 times the limit. The release option faced heavy criticism at town meetings in Fukushima and Tokyo in August, when TEPCO and the Japanese government officials provided little explanation about the contamination. TEPCO says it has the capacity to store up to 1.37 million tons of water through 2020, and it cannot stay at the plant forever. South Korea expressed its concerns over Japan's decision last week. The ocean is not the property of one country but a shared resource of the world. Releasing contaminated water into the sea is likely to have a significant impact on the marine environment and the safety of marine products. Some experts say the water can be stored for decades, but others say the tanks take up too much space and could interfere with ongoing decommissioning work, which the Japanese government hopes to finish before the 2020 Tokyo Summer Olympics. Isunje, Arirang News. Now, as the United States continues to tighten its monetary policy and its 10-year yields hit a 7 uh, year high. There are some concerns about financial instability in some emerging markets. However, a study released by the Bank of Korea shows the possibility of a currency crisis spreading in emerging markets is in fact low. Countries with relatively high foreign debt like Turkey and Argentina showed signs of a currency crisis. But the BOK says unlike the so-called taper tantrum seen in 2013, the drop in stocks and the number of countries affected by the jitters was pretty limited. The study says South Korea's capital markets remain stable, supported by a healthy current account surplus and ample foreign reserves, but added the ongoing US-China trade spat remains a downside risk. Now, having a monthly newspaper subscription is nothing new to most of us, but what about subscribing for beer, shirts or even flowers on a recurring basis? The rise of the subscription economy in South Korea shows how the long-held traditional business model or pay per product could be slowly shifting towards subscriptions. So and Young has this report. Every Monday, Mr. Han starts his day by waiting to see which shirt will be delivered to his door. A year ago, he signed up for a subscription service, receiving five new returnable shirts each and every week. I spend a lot of time every morning worrying about what to wear. Now there's no need to worry because shirts are delivered every week. Plus, I save time and money on direct cleaning. Weekly Shirts offers its customers the choice of three to five shirts a week. For as little as 40 US dollars a month, consumers can enjoy clean and freshly pressed shirts, freeing them from the hassle of shopping. We have a diverse consumer base, including men living alone, dual-income families, and people in their 40s and 50s. Our customers find it convenient to have someone else do their shopping and laundry for them. As well as daily items such as shirts, there are also customers sending themselves gifts such as flowers to add little extra happiness to their lives. Gukka is the country's flower subscription service. Consumers choose the size of bundle they want, and florists arrange and send them every two weeks. Our business is to make people happy every day with flowers. I believe this emphasis on every day draws people's attention to our service. Koreans usually buy flowers for weddings and graduations, but the subscription service is changing the culture. It's convenient to receive flowers at a time of my choosing. I get my own space to relieve my stress at the office where I spend most of my day. 
The trend towards the subscription economy will increase as people want practical goods and services that give maximum satisfaction for minimum cost. The fact people save time and effort also draws them to subscription services. The expert says such services will be more individualized with technological advances such as AI, meeting consumer needs in the future. Seon Kyung, Arirang News. Now, uh, staying with uh, some tech news, uh, robots are becoming a more common sight at fast food restaurants, convenience stores and supermarkets uh, here in Korea and in other parts of the world. This amid a global race to automate such stores. Our Park se with this story. At this convenience store, a robot greets customers at the checkout counter. It even recognizes returning customers. The robot converses with customers while they make their payments. Through emotional communication, it may help robots exist alongside humans. A robot is in charge of the international food section at this supermarket. It provides product information and an automated concierge service to shoppers. It used to be difficult for customers to get information about unfamiliar products on the spot. The robot provides both product information and suggestions. These technologies won't be commercialized immediately, but retailers are racing to automate their stores, in part due to the government's push to increase the minimum hourly wage. Park Se-young, Arirang News. Now, journalists and experts gathered in Singapore over the weekend for an annual conference to discuss the issues and challenges in East and Southeast Asia and the wider Indo-Pacific region. Our Kim Jion was there. And she files this report from Singapore. Around 50 people from more than 10 countries, including South Korea, Japan, and ASEAN member states, participate in the 7th Annual Editors' Roundtable titled ASEAN and Indo-Pacific Challenges Ahead. It was chiefly hosted by Jakarta-based think tank, the Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia. Participants discussed a number of issues that affect the region, including some of the main themes at this year's World Economic Forum on ASEAN, which was held in Hanoi last month. In particular, some participants touched upon how ASEAN can embrace the so-called fourth industrial revolution and how South Korea can help facilitate regional cooperation in building a people-centered, people-oriented community. So South Korea developed a new southbound policy in order to connect uh, Korea with Southeast Asia. Uh, so that is very promising uh, for, for the region. Korea has advantages uh, and strength and competitive advantages when it comes to innovations, strengths uh, that South Korea has. So South Korea can integrate innovation diplomacy as one of the core components of its southbound uh, policy towards Southeast Asia. Participants also touched upon economic, political and security issues, with the last session focused on the prevalence of so-called fake news in East Asia. They also discussed growing concerns about hydroelectric dams and the need to build infrastructure selectively by considering a region's environment and culture. South Korea's new southern policy seeks more cooperation with Southeast Asia and India, with the government in Seoul encouraging Korean companies to start or expand their business in the region. Kim ji Arirang News, Singapore. Good morning. Today is Hanno, literally translated as cold dew, marking the arrival of chillier temperatures. And Seoul surely had the coldest morning temperatures of the season, down to a single digits this morning. And Baekwaeyeong in Gangwon-do province had lows near zero. But temperatures will rise rapidly as the day goes on. And sunny skies will boost the highs into the 20s. Some 10 to 15 degrees of temperature differences are expected under mostly sunny skies. So let's take a look at today's daily highs. 
Now, Seoul will get up to 22 degrees Celsius. Chuncheon, Daegu, and Daejeon will get up to 21 degrees this afternoon. Now, it seems like we are going to have some big drop in temperatures by the later half of the week. And tomorrow is Hangul Day here in Korea, the national holiday to celebrate the creation of the Korean alphabet. The weather will be good for any outdoor activities. That's Korea for you, and here's international weather for viewers around the world. Well, that's all we have for now on this Monday morning here in Seoul. Do stay tuned to Adidang TV and uh, we'll have our next newscast coming up for you at noon Korea time with our very own Lee ji -yoon. So until then, goodbye. Mukbang is all.